it's now time to introduce our next uh, speaker, Stephen Holden. Stephen is a PhD candidate and associate lecturer at Manchester Law School, with a primary research focus on whistleblowers environment on, of secrecy. Uh, Stephen has contributed towards various research projects, including the EU Commission funded virtue project, which examined the complex interconnection between tax crime and corruption, and the NATO funded project, Whistling at the Fake Project which focused on hostile information activities and the unauthorized information disclosures. Stephen is also a senior contributor to the Corporate Social Responsibility and Business Ethics Block, and an assistant editor to the Corporate Crime Observatory. Today, uh, Stephen Holden's presentation is on reason shopping and undermining of a whistleblower uh, protection. Mr. Holden, welcome to uh, our uh, session, and we look forward to listening to your uh, interesting presentation. In the meantime, thanks a lot to Flavio for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think we will have time to discuss a lot about it. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to drive both Costa and uh, Donato insane slightly by just moving the camera because I am one of these annoying people who likes to stand and present. Uh, I'm a bit drunk, but never mind. Well, the camera's a bit wonky, it should be the expression as opposed to. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, today I am going to discuss something which is particularly important and pertinent. We've discussed an awful lot so far what we expect from people. We've discussed an awful lot what we expect from those who detect and uh, are first alerted to malfeasance within our systems and organizations. However, we haven't discussed really what they do or what their role is or to be honest, the retaliation and the actions that are taken against. So very, very briefly, we're gonna have a look at whistleblowing and reason shopping and how reason shopping undermines those protections. We've looked a lot through previous presentations at the act of whistleblowing, but not really specifically what it is. And it is those in uh, with intimate knowledge for the internal conducting of the company, those who know where the skeletons and the bodies are hidden. It's those people being able to come to a regulator, to be able to come internally within a company, to operate within the compliance mechanisms and say, hey, something's going wrong here and we should stop this. People are going to get hurt or society is going to be damaged. Ultimately, when we look at the early transgressions with the uh, early 2000s, that implemented the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and that expressly recognised that the lack of corporate accountability, the lack of being able to hold corporations to account for what they are doing, has dramatically undermined investor confidence in corporations. And as we know, investors are the most important thing. This has led to what we may understand as a pluralist regulatory system. And this is predicated on our understanding of there being an asymmetry of knowledge. Those within a company are always going to be much more knowledgeable and have much more information than those on the outside of the company, be they auditors, or regulators, or investors. If people want to hide information, if they want to start burying things, if they want to keep a system of black books, they're going to. And what this has done is increase the expectation of people to speak out against wrongdoing, to be able, when they've detected it, to be able to come out and say, hey, we need to stop this. And this is what has led to this kind of pluralist policing environment and this decentralized regulation. We are all expected to want to take a regulatory function in society, although we aren't police ourselves. So we create, we have this policing function. And this has, uh, has a corresponding organizational response. If we're expected to undertake this enhanced regulatory system, uh, managed to kill a monitor, uh, if we are expected to undertake this enhanced regulatory uh, responsibility, the counterpoint to that is we're protected. If we take these risks, the deal is we will protect society, but society protects us when we take that risk, that the law and the regulators will intervene to stop us being retaliated against, to stop us losing our job, if you're in America, losing your health care, if your children go to a private school, being removed from those schools. Um, so these things are, are, are saliently important. These protections are saliently important. Whistleblowers are one of the least expensive and most effective sources for feedback about mistakes the firm may be making. Whistleblowers protect organizations and businesses from themselves. However, uh, there are instances when this doesn't go well. And I've written quite extensively about the Kong and Gulf International Bank case for a very, very, very brief breakdown. Um, one of the internal auditors within uh, the bank, Ms. Kong, 
detected the use of a um, document or a form that the bank shouldn't be used, and it created an anti-money laundering vulnerability uh, systematic within the bank. She raised the alarm as she was meant to do, as was her function as an auditor. Um, however, was that the, the head of legal took umbrage to this and said, hang on, you're questioning my ability to do my job. You're questioning my ability to understand what forms I'm meant to use. And because of that, I feel bullied. I feel undermined. I don't like that you, as an auditor who is designed to detect wrongdoing, detected some wrongdoing, and it happened to be my wrongdoing, and that makes me look bad. And now I'm not particularly happy with this. And resultantly, uh, Ms. Kong was fired. And this should be a slam dunk case. This should be extremely straightforward. We have some wrongdoing, we have some internal reporting, and then there is an act of retaliation. So this should be straightforward. That is an easy tribunal decision. You have been fired for being a whistleblower. However, the official reasoning given by the firm was that she was dogmatic in her approach, she was forensic, that she doesn't take a proportionate approach to risk. We should be allowed to take more risk than she wanted us to take or that the regulations allow. And that her behaviors resulted in people not wanting to work with her because she was detecting wrongdoing and she was pointing to people's wrongdoing. These were the official reasons provided. Ultimately, in the uh, first two tribunals, the bank was successful. The bank applied something called the separate, uh, the separability principle, which is a means of disconnecting the, the act of whistleblowing and the retaliation. And there's meant to be an intervening fact in that. So for those of us who, who did the LLB, the idea of um, uh, that connection that flows right through was meant to have been a severance of that connection. And the second tier tribunal agreed. They said, actually, there has been a complete disconnect. The act of retaliation, she was fired, not simply because she made a disclosure. She was fired because people didn't like how she made this disclosure. She didn't like the words that we used. She didn't like the environment that was created when she was pointing out the criminality. So she wasn't fired for the disclosure. She was fired for pointing it out to people and made people feel about that they were doing wrong. And two courts went with this, both the first and second tier tribunal. So we went to the Court of Appeal and amazingly, the Court of Appeal agreed. The Court of Appeal said this was enough to implement the, the separability principle that her, her legal team, Ms. Kong's legal team argued and said, if an auditor has a duty to not make people simply feel bad when pointing out their criminality and their wrongdoing, we're just undermining the entire point of whistleblowing. We're undermining the entire point of auditing. And the Court of Appeal completely disagreed with this. They said, no, we think that Miss Kong was in the wrong here. Um, and this is what we may understand as reason shopping. But importantly, this expands the concept of reason shopping. Reason shopping at its heart is the idea that there is, um, you, you can be retaliated against, but it's often months later for something completely unrelated. There'll be uh, an, an unfavorable progress review. People will set you unrealistic targets. You'll be excluded from groups. You'll, there will be something, you know, you'll be moved to the basement. You'll have your access taken off you. And these kind of retaliations aren't directly linked to the disclosure themselves. And when you're fired, they go, oh, no, 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 no. We fired them because they were underperforming. That's nothing to do with the, the, the whistleblowing. However, problematically, they, we've had an expansion of concept. This allows a direct link between the disclosure, the conduct of the person making the disclosure, and the act of retaliation. And in doing so, this has changed the landscape of reason shopping by allowing a direct correlation and a direct connection between the disclosure and between the retaliation. And this is problematic for us all. It incentivizes uh, summary dismissal. It incentivizes a system of fire now, ask questions later. Because if you can prove and if you can say, oh, no, they looked into the disclosure more and more, then that's going to be taken into account. More. Whereas if you're just summarily fired, this is going to be they're just going to say, oh, no, it's because of the work attitude and because of the work atmosphere. It also creates the idea of the model whistleblower. We are all meant to be these saints of secular culture. We're meant to be these people who act purely from out of morality and out of altruism. That if you do something that isn't strictly, strictly necessary to the act of whistleblowing, then you are the problem. And ultimately, as humans, that's not how we operate. And further, it undermines the role of an auditor. The point of an auditor is to find wrongdoing, it is to find um, illegality, it's to protect the company, it's to protect the investors, it's to protect the members and the employees, and the shareholders, it's to protect all of these people. And suddenly, we can now undermine all of that. 
Because if you disclose wrongdoing, you just say, well, that made me feel bad. And now I can fire you for saying you made me feel bad. So what we have now is a massive hole and a massive undermining in the regulatory system, the regulatory environment, reflective of, of, of this reasonability principle. Uh, I do have much more to say. I would absolutely encourage you to go and read the article that's on the Corporate uh, Prime Observatory, which I've written about this, it goes into it in much more detail. Uh, but unfortunately, that's my time up. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Really a brilliant presentation. Fantastic. Thank you <laughs> for clearly illustrating how an employer can a true reason shopping undermine wisdom for work protection. Uh, unfortunately, everything is fine. Unfortunately, the attempt to uh, persuade the courts you know, that dismissing a whistleblower from his employment or her employment is not related to disclosure is a, a defensive strategy and part uh, of retaliation against the employee. 